What you can see here is a bit of a fight for the nest box. The cream leg bar, the grey girl on the left, is disputing the buff Orpington's right to sit there. But the buff Orpington's gone broody. She wants to hatch some eggs. And when she's broody and when she's raising those chicks, she won't lay any eggs. So what we do is preserve eggs in times of plenty to get us through when the hens are brooding or when the hens are molting and eggs are far scarcer. Today, we're going to show you three ways to preserve eggs. Hello, welcome to English Country Life. Welcome to the chicken enclosure on a beautiful March day and welcome to preserving eggs. We've done this video in part because Fiona and I had a conversation with someone recently who was almost dumbfounded at the idea of preserving eggs, but it's very traditional. It's been done for hundreds of years. So we promised to do a video where we showed a variety of techniques. Now we do that because we raise hens and the buff Orpingtons will brood, i.e. sit on eggs for three weeks, and they will then raise those chicks for six to nine weeks or even longer. In that period, those hens will not lay an egg. And there's also another period later in the year where those hens are molting. They will go off legs. They use all the protein they can get to build new feathers. So there are long periods with traditional breeds where you don't have many eggs. So we've developed techniques to preserve the eggs in times of plenty so that we have eggs when there's less available. Today, we're going to show you three of those techniques. We're going to show you drying eggs. Don't confuse it with those horrible things from World War II you may have heard of. Really good quality, modern dried eggs are delightful. We're going to show you freezing eggs, which is a great technique and accessible to anyone with a freezer. And we're going to show you preserving eggs in water glass, which is a traditional technique. And water glass is the old name for sodium silicate. Each method has its pros and cons. And we can talk about those a little bit at the end. But they're all good methods. They just lend themselves to different uses at the end. So let's take a look. To freeze eggs, you need something to freeze them in, and I find silicon mini muffin trays ideal. They're really flexible, so you can turn things out easily, and the holes are more or less the right size for one large egg. The problem you do have is they're really flexible, so when full, it's easy to spill everything when you take it to the freezer. So put them on a baking tray before you start. To prepare the eggs for freezing, I crack them in turn into a glass jug. Check to make sure there's no shell in them, that the eggs are in good condition, and then add them to a blender. A dozen eggs is enough to fill that tray, and all I'm going to do is blend them so the whites and the yolks are evenly mixed, just for a few seconds. I try not to fill each cell of the tray to the very top, because if I do, I'll inevitably spill some on the way to the freezer. I'll freeze those flat on the tray overnight. Here we are the next day and you can see how easily the eggs turn out from the silicon mould. The light layer is just the foam where the egg's been beaten in the blender. We store the eggs by putting four at a time into a freezer bag. And when we do that, we put two in the bottom, then we roll the bag and put in another two. And that way, they don't all stick together in the bag and we can take out just a couple when we need them from the freezer. Don't throw the eggshells away, we've got a use for them. I'll show you that later. The process for dried eggs is similar at the beginning to the process for frozen eggs. Crack each egg into a jug, check that there's no shell in it and there's no problems with the egg, and then pop it into a blender to whiz up into a smooth liquid. 
In our blender, you can do two dozen eggs at a time. But I do find if you try and put more than that in, at a fast speed, they try and escape through the lid. The next step in the process is to scramble the eggs once they've been blended. Use a non-stick pan because you don't want to use any oil or fat because that could go rancid when you store the powdered egg. And only put in a very thin layer at a time because ultimately we're going to dry and then powder these eggs. So you don't want great thick lumps of egg that's hard to dry and break up later. One thing you will need to do is keep moving the egg around. Because there's no fat in the pan, it will tend to stick and burn. So it's very sensible to take a non-metallic spatula and just keep the egg moving till it goes nice and solid and thoroughly cooked. You're gonna have to do it in batches. So get a big bowl ready. And each time that you've scrambled one set of egg, pour it into the bowl and let it cool. Spread your cool scrambled egg out on dehydrator trays. I can get a dozen eggs on every tray of this dehydrator, so over a hundred in total if I've got enough eggs that I need to preserve. Once I've set up all I need, set the dehydrator to about 60 centigrade, 140 Fahrenheit, and generally I find I need about 18 hours of drying time. You'll know when the eggs are dry because they will literally be crisp and hard and if you just handle them and drop them you can hear how dry those eggs are here again you can hear how dry those egg pieces are and what i'm doing is just popping them into a coffee grinder and i'm going to use that coffee or spice grinder to whiz them up and reduce them to a fine powder I find to do it in little pulses is better because you don't want to overheat or burn out the motor. Now, once you go into a fine powder, what I like to do is pour them through a fine flour sieve because there'll always be a few little hard pieces, a few little lumps that are left in the bottom of the grinder that haven't ground up. And all I do is pop these larger pieces back in the grinder and I'll grind them again with the next batch of egg that I put in. Once I've sieved it all, what I tend to use is a jam funnel and just pour the powdered sieved egg into an airtight jar. Doesn't need to be anything fancy, an old jam jar is perfectly adequate. And that's it. In those two jars are two dozen eggs and they're shelf stable for at least two years. To use them, add a little bit of water blend carefully to a thick paste and then dilute it slowly until you get to the consistency of beaten egg. The next process we want to show you is preserving eggs in water glass. You need a large jar to do this, probably at least two litres if not larger in size, and you need to be able to get your hand inside the neck in order to do that, because you have to place the eggs in, not drop them in. You're also going to need some sodium silicate, which is, tends to be what we call water glass nowadays. It's used for a number of purposes, including sealing concrete, fairly widely available, but obviously get a good grade. We're gonna dilute that, so you're gonna need a measuring jug, and you're going to need some clean, fresh tap water to dilute it down. You can see here how this jar is only just enough to allow me to get my hand in and out of the jar. So, bigger jar with a wider mouth, even better. But obviously, you need more eggs to fill it. You can see I'm laying the eggs on the side. Some people will tell you the eggs need to be pointy and down, which is important if you're subsequently going to set eggs for incubation. But for preservation purposes, by the science of how this works with water glass, provided they are unwashed, clean and uncracked, these eggs will be absolutely fine. In the first layer, you can see between each egg, there are almost sort of little hollows. And what I've tried to do is sit the second layer of eggs into those hollows, so the eggs lock together. 
The one thing we're desperate to avoid here is any egg becoming cracked because it will then allow water glass into the egg, but also egg into the water glass. And water glass has an antibacterial quality that keeps the eggs fresh. But if you pollute that with egg, clearly you're compromising the whole jar. Eventually you'll have filled your jar completely to the top. And one of the advantages of having a jar that narrows into its neck is that you can lock the final layer of eggs under the shoulder of the jar and prevent one sort of bobbing to the surface in the neck of the jar. Next job is to mix up the water glass. I reckon about a third to half the volume of your jar is the right amount of water glass provided you've locked your eggs together tightly. So I'm using 700 millilitres of clean fresh water to which I will add 100 millilitres of sodium silicate water glass. That'll give me 800 millilitres in total which should be enough to fully surround all the eggs in my jar. Once you've added the two liquids to each other, it's worthwhile giving them a good stir. And you can see that the water glass in the water gives a slightly sort of hazy appearance, slightly shimmery appearance. Once you mix them well, that will disappear. Carefully fill your jar with the mixed solution and ensure that the jar is filled to well above the level of the eggs. It is important with water glass that the eggs stay below the surface. So in this jar, I'll have to juggle it so you can see the liquids there. You can see that the eggs are locked under the shoulders. If you haven't got that tight, pop something like a saucer on top to make sure they're submerged and store these in a cool, dark place like a cellar for up to six months. Well, preserving all those eggs means you end up with a lot of eggshells and we have a use for them. But what's important before we try and use them again is to sterilize them. The easiest way we find of doing that, put them in a baking tray in a medium oven. Now this is not something I would suggest doing on its own so just do it when the oven's on anyway. We're fortunate because the S is lit in the evenings. And after a couple of hours any remaining bits of egg in those shells has been cooked off and have a listen. The shells are so hot that they're clicking, so they've been thoroughly sterilised and we'll set them to cool. Having cooled the eggs, I want to grind them to a powder, so I crush them in my hand first and drop the roughly crushed pieces into the same grinder that we use for grinding the dried egg. And all it takes really is a quick whiz up in that grinder to get those eggshells to a powder. Unfortunately this grinder isn't completely airtight, you do get some fine dust escaping from the edge, but there's nothing to worry about. And what you end up with then is basically a fine powder and we're going to store that powder because we can use that instead of things like oyster shell to feed back to the chickens. So we'll tip that into a jam jar and you'll get an awful lot of eggshells into one jam jar probably somewhere around about a hundred but if we include that in the chickens mash they don't recognize it as eggs because you don't want to encourage egg pecking from chickens what it does do is give them all the nutrients the calcium carbonate and other things they need to make really strong eggshells well that was egg preserving which method do we use we use all of them at different times I find that freezing eggs is great, it's quick, it's convenient, you can do it with a minimum of kitten fuss. But it does mean that what you start with is effectively beaten egg. So great for scramble, great for an omelette, great for cake making, clearly less good if you want a fried egg. So what about drying eggs? Well, probably a little bit less convenient to use than the frozen egg. but lasts almost forever. I mean years, literally a couple of years, no problem at all. Brilliantly light, so you can take them camping or backpacking or all of those kind of things. They are 
very compact, so they take up very little space in your larder. So if you're in a small flat, dried egg, really useful. As for eggs in water glass, well, you have to buy some sodium silicate, but it's not expensive to get a small amount of that. You get whole egg at the end of it, so you can have a fried egg if you want it. You, the choice is yours, but the yolks can go a little bit runny after a few months, and it can be a little bit of a faff to make them up. And of course, storage space, they take a lot of space. Years gone by, people would have stored them in a big enamel bucket in their pantry, but if you're tight for space, it may not be the method for you. If you're enjoying this kind of content, can you spare us five seconds? Give us a thumbs up down below and please leave us a comment. If there's any other kinds of food storage you'd like to see, do let us know. We will be doing a lot more videos over the coming weeks. We're certainly going to cover a lot more on things like soap making. We've been asked to cover things like dish soap and laundry soap and we're certainly going to get to that. And if you'd like to see those videos coming up, hit the subscribe button down there and the bell next to it and you'll hear every time we upload a new video. But whatever you do, stay safe and come back and see us soon. Take care.